We're speaking today with 93-year-old Brooks Jackson, an original member of New York City Ballet and art gallery owner who throughout his professional tenure has worked with some of the 20th century's most celebrated artists. During the course of this audio retrospective, we will listen in as he recalls many of his career highlights and memories. His is a remarkable story of the rise from difficult and humble beginnings during the Great Depression era, as he describes while speaking of his early life growing up in Texas, where he worked as a farmhand. I was born February 28th, 1924, in Athens, Texas. My mother had TB at the time of my birth and died four years later. My father was a blacksmith and with his brothers had their own shop. The business slowed down. It was during the Depression days after 1929. Little by little, business faded away, and the tractor came in and did away with teams of mules and horses to plow. So he had to close the business. And uh, we moved to Malakoff, and that's where we moved to the farm. And that's where I started doing farm labor as a teenager. In high school, I remember when Hitler invaded Poland. We all listened in the principal's office on the radio to the announcement of the invasion of Poland. And, uh, well, I graduated. There must have been, I think we were 20 in senior class. Most, uh, many of the boys joined the armed forces after, after the bombing of Hawaii. Brooks became very interested in learning ballet after he moved to San Antonio and attended performances by Diaghilev's Ballet Russe and American Ballet Theater, where he saw Anton Dolan and Dame Alicia Markova perform. But learning ballet in Texas during the late 1930s was no easy task. Fortunately, he befriended a young woman who introduced him to a local ballet teacher in San Antonio, which led to his first performance experience. So in San Antonio, I was introduced to the ballet world through a girl, Maxime Vuerger, and she knew a dancer, ex-dancer, who would teach us the bar. And we went to her house in her living room, hanging on to the chairs and what have you. She showed us the positions and the exercises, and that's how the interest started boiling in my brain that I wanted to be a dancer. I didn't know what it meant, but I wanted to be a dancer. And when I saw the Ballet Russe and also the American Ballet Theater, I went crazy over the idea and decided that's what I wanted to do. After a while, uh, she knew a woman, again, Maxime seemed to know everybody, who was producing and using girls only dances for the troops at Randolph Field and Brooks Field air bases in, around San Antonio. So she needed a boy to do the mazurka from Coppelia. And uh, I didn't know anything about the music or anything. I went to rehearsal and I did what I was told and showed what I was to do and I did it and not knowing exactly what I was doing but I did it in front of these service people and uh, that was my introduction to being on the stage. Brooks's professional life as a dancer had only just begun. The next step was to get to a city where he could expand his horizons and study with more knowledgeable and notable instructors. There was only one place to go, New York City. But getting there wasn't easy, and it meant leaving his home in Texas at the age of 18 and everything he knew behind. It was an obsession of mine to be a dancer. I wanted to dance, and I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how much work or hard work it was. But I was young, and when you're young, you do things without thinking of what is involved in it. But I was determined to do it, and the opportunity arose that someone, uh, another boy, had a car, white Cadillac convertible, and proposed, why don't we all, the three of us, there was another boy, I say boys, we were grown, to go to New York, just for the hell of it. And in those days, it was during the war. Gasoline was rationed, and we all pulled our coupons because you had to have a coupon to 
have gasoline for cars, and that's how we got to New York and how he got back to Texas. I arrived in New York in December, I think. New York City in the early 1940s was arguably the cultural capital of the United States at the time. Just a few years prior, in 1936, choreographer George Balanchine founded his now-famous School of American Ballet, which was where Brooks attended to further his ballet training. When I arrived in New York in 1943, I went to a cocktail party, and that's where I met Pavel Chelichev. Chelichev was a painter of Russian descent, naturally, and besides painting, he designed costumes for theatrical productions in Berlin and worked with Balanchine in Paris with Diaghilev at the time, had come to America, and he suggested that I go to the School of American Ballet, which I did. <laughs> Most of the teachers at the School of American Ballet were from St. Petersburg, the Russian school there. So it was Pierre Vladimirov and Anatole Obuchov. They were the teachers, mostly for men. Pierre Vladimirov was married to Felia Dubrovska. She was a ballerina with Diaghilev Company, and uh, Obuchov was married to another Russian ballerina called Vera Nemchinova. When Abukov was teaching class, he would go around and snap his finger when we were all hanging on to the bar during the exercise. He would go around and snap his fingers right in the face of the dancer. And all the girls were terrified of this little man who had a very deep voice and sort of trembling sort of feeling they would get and one day he stopped in front of me and started to do this and I started to laugh and he started to laugh also and then walked on and then there was Muriel Stewart one of the ballerinas of the Pavlova company which when Pavlova wasn't able to perform or some, for some reason Muriel stood in for her she was the understudy and uh, Muriel taught classes for a mixed group of boys and girls. But I, after I'd had my class with Obukov or Vladimirov, I'd go and watch her and sit on the bench next to her, and she would teach and she would sort of make fun of what was happening at the bar, or the variations afterwards, and laugh like crazy. She was known for her wit which I enjoyed very much. <laughs> My first adagio classes were with the School of American Ballet, usually taught by Pierre Vladimirov and Anatole Obuchov. My partner often was Maria Tolchiv, which we did the pas de deux from Les Sylphides and the Rose Adagio, Aurora's Wedding and things like that. The way of dressing for the classes was usually black tights, white shoes and socks, and a white top, either a shirt or a t-shirt. Speaking of dress for the classes, there were no canvas shoes in those days. They were all leather, and uh, tights were wool, woven wool. And the toe shoes for girls, they're always darning the toe with wool. I remember Danilova, when the girls tied their toe shoes on, they had to be sure that they, after they tied the final knot to be tucked under the ribbon on the leg so it didn't show. And if it did, she would scold them. She said, you're very unprofessional. Within a relatively short period of time, Brooks was able to advance his technical capabilities by studying at the School of American Ballet, as well as secure his very first contract as a professional dancer in New York City. Oddly enough, it wasn't with a ballet company, but rather a well-known modern dance troupe. First time on the stage was with Martha Graham, because she lost one of her male dancers, and I went. Never have done modern dance or, or you know, class. What year was that? Must have been 40, 43, I guess. The theater? 
It was a theater, I think it was called National, behind the old Metropolitan Opera on the corner. And there was Eric Hawkins, Mae MacDonald, Yuri Ko, Pearl Lang, uh, over some others, I can't remember. That was the first season that I know of, maybe she had done. But it was a week long in New York. That was unusual for even Martha Graham to have a season of a week. And uh, I was in Letters to the World and Death and Entrances. Those are the only two that I was in. And she did some other thing with the Noguchi's costumes and set. In rehearsal, it was sort of like being in a Sunday school class or something. How can I say? Uh, the priestess of the dance, Martha Graham, sitting, giving the instructions. And uh, that was a sort of atmosphere. In a rest period during the rehearsal, the modern dancers would sit on the floor and I'd stand up and try to do pirouettes and they all glared at me. And in those days, modern dancers and ballet dancers didn't speak, so to say. And she called me over and said, Brooks, try not to dissipate for the next two weeks. And so I was sort of like a thorn on the rose bush or something. The last time I saw Martha Graham was Studio 54. It was one of those soirees before it opens, you know. There she was backstage, well, backstage, on a huge pile of pillows. And I got courage enough to walk up and I sat next to her and I said, I used to be in your company and she just looked at me. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure you don't remember me, but I was. And I said, it just went over her head. She was already 80 something, dressed by Halston or something, you know. He was all, she was always next to him, along with Liza Minnelli and all the other. <laughs> Brooks's second professional opportunity as a dancer in New York City came in 1946 as a founding member of the newly formed Ballet Society under the artistic direction of George Balanchine. Ballet Society was the organization that just two years later, in 1948, would morph into the world-famous New York City Ballet. So Ballet Society was started with a subscription audience only. All of the rehearsals, as I remember, took place at the School of American Ballet, which was run by the Russian woman called Arusova and another one, Molostov. Kopekin was the pianist, mostly for the Ballet Society and later New York City Ballet, but I don't think he ever played for the classes at the School of American Ballet. Naturally, Lincoln Kirstein was around. Lincoln was always present, but not maybe not physically, but he was always concerned and had something to say about everything that happened because it was he and Balanchine, it was their idea, so naturally he was always always included in all the discussions. We performed only as, as Ballet Society in New York City at the High School for Needles and Trade in down on Lower Fifth Avenue or somewhere downtown, the Ziegfeld Theater and uh, another auditorium in the Catholic Church on Lexington Avenue and 76th Street. One of the first ballets in Ballet Society was Four Temperaments Music by Hindermith and Costumes by Kurt Seligman and naturally Balanchine's choreography. But after the first performance, the costumes were not used anymore because it was difficult for the dancers to move or being partnered or what I remember in the last scene, the corps de ballet had big wooden wings that we had to move around, and that was difficult. After that, the ballet was done in practice clothes and was a big success always. I did one of the th three movements with Beatrice Tompkins in the beginning. The curtain went up, just the two of us were on stage in the costumes originally. And we did our little pas de deux together and off stage, and then the second and the third, and then the first temperament came, danced by William Dollar 
Rita Carlin and Georgia Harden. The second one was Sanguinic, danced by Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Moylan and Freddie Daniele. And the third movement was Phlegmatic, danced by Todd Bollinger and four girls. The last temperament was Choleric, and it was danced by Tanny Quill Leclerc. And the original costume was sort of like a dragonfly, wings and everything. That was, well, as, as I said, all of the costumes were done away with in the future performances. Uh, the other ballet that I remember, with two that I remember of the first performance, was Four Temperaments and L'Enfant et Sortilège, which is the spellbound child. And I portrayed the armchair for the child. Story by Colette and Ravel music and choreography of George Balanchine. The idea of the story was that the child becomes under the influence of the sorceress and all the furniture becomes alive, starts to move to the child and he goes from one piece of furniture to the other. I don't know the rest of the story. There was another ballet for Ballet Society that we danced at the old Ziegfeld Theatre before they tore it down called Bacchus and Ariadne. As I remember, the music was by Vittorio Rieti, and Tiny danced the lead, Ariadne, and uh, I remember dancing one of the boys, and uh, Dick Beard, Richard Beard, was the other boy, and we were painted gold on one side of her face, and we turned around, we were normal on the other side. While dancing for Ballet Society, which only performed three times per year, Brooks, like many professional dancers before and after him, supplemented his layoff periods by performing in various productions on Broadway, television, and film. When I wasn't working with Ballet Society or New York City Ballet, in order to supplement my income, I did shows on Broadway and some on television. One was Kate Smith, TV Hour. Another one was with Janice Page, back up, like backup boys, and the color transmission of Cinderella with uh, Tanny Kilda Claire Balanchine did all of these choreography. And then uh, the Ed Sullivan show with Maria Tolchi and uh, Andre Klefsky. Two of the Broadway shows that I performed in were Song of Norway and Chocolate Soldier, choreographed by George Balanchine. The original cast of Song of Norway were dancers from the Ballet Russe, and in that group was Danilova, Maria Tallchief, and I replaced one of the dancers in the Corps de Ballet. In Chocolate Soldier, the lead dancers were Francisco Monción and Mary Ellen Moylan. Both were from Ballet Society, and I was one of the boys in the Corps de Ballet. The performance schedule on Broadway during the 1940s was the same as it is present day. Eight shows a week with two performances a day, usually on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Brooks recalls an amusing story about performing in the cast of Chocolate Soldier on Broadway and the dangers of eating strong flavored food in between performances. Well, in Chocolate Soldier, I remember between matinee and evening performances, I went out to dinner and had a lot of garlic for the food was laced with garlic anyway and dancing the waltz in one of the, the numbers. I was dancing with this girl who was a Broadway gypsy, and uh, we were dancing, and she tripped me, and I fell on stage, and I got up, and she said, I'll teach you to eat garlic. Brooks also appeared in the 1945 original Broadway production, Polonaise, choreographed by David Lachine, and recalls difficulties during the final stages of creating the production, which required Stella Adler to be called in. The dances in Polonaise were choreographed by David Lachine, who had been with the Diaglyph Ballet Company, and uh, his wife, Tatiana Ryabyshinska, who was one of the baby ballerinas of Diaglyph. She had a part in uh, Polonaise, I don't remember the title. But anyway, when we were had come back to New York before opening Holidays on Broadway, 
they were having trouble with the story, how it flowed or whatever. Stella Adler came in to help stage it and she couldn't get it so she brought in her brother, Luther. And they both worked on it before we opened on Broadway. And there was a big battle scene uh, with the dancers and jumping over barracks or whatever, you know, barricades and uh, waving the flag. George Balanchine and Lincoln Kirstein founded New York City Ballet in 1948, and Brooks joined the newly formed company as an original member. Shortly after, in 1949, George Balanchine hired choreographer Jerome Robbins as artistic associate of the newly formed company, and his first commission as choreographer for New York City Ballet was a piece called The Guests, which dealt with racial intolerance. Brooks was in the original cast of Jerome Robbins' The Guests and recalls an emotional moment during the final dress rehearsal at New York's City Center Studios. It was during a rehearsal. He was composing the ballet, Jerry, and he invited Mark Blitzstein, who wrote the music, Linda Bernstein, who was the conductor, and Jerry, the choreographer. And we're th two groups. One had a, like the Hindus, a red dot between the eyes, was between two groups. One was invited, the other was not invited. That was what it was all about, prejudice and that sort of thing. Because it was just after the war, you know, that was all in fresh in everybody's mind. And we went through a rehearsal of the ballet, guest, and uh, I remember it was upstairs in the city center they were up there watching the rehearsal, and after we completed, my dear, they were all in tears. The three of them, Robbins, Blitzstein, and Bernstein, in tears. Not all of Brooks's experiences working with Jerome Robbins at New York City Ballet were as emotional as the creation of the guests, as he recalls when speaking of creating and rehearsing Fanfare, the one-act ballet created by Jerome Robbins to Benjamin Britten's The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. In the Britain, uh, the Symphony for Children, I was the bass fiddle, and I hated doing it. And Jerry adored to, to see me do it because I thought it was like me with my nose in the air. I thought it was beneath me. I always have that attitude. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he would sit there and make me do these ridiculous things and laugh like crazy. Nobody else did, but he laughed like crazy. And the audience, when I did on stage, nobody thought it was funny either. But, <laughs> but he changed it eventually after I left. Those early days at New York City Ballet were an exciting time, with many legendary creative artists present. Brooks performed a wide range of repertoire with the company and worked alongside many prominent choreographers, including Anthony Tudor. When Jerry came into the company, later came Nora Kay, Hugh Lang, Diana Adams, Roy Tobias, Richard Beard, and then Tudor came to do his ballets, Lila Garden and La Gloire, The Glory, for Diana Adams and Tanya Kildare. Then he did the story of Traviata or Camille, Lady of the Camellias. And I remember we were rehearsing the steps, but uh, the music they weren't quite satisfied with. They couldn't use Traviata or Verdi. It was too well known. And so I suggested that they use the music of Verdi, opera, uh, Nabucco. And that's what they did. New York City Ballet began performing for the first time outside of New York City in 1951 when they performed in Chicago, Illinois, Red Rocks, Colorado, and Los Angeles, California. The company's first overseas tour happened in 1952 with five months of performances in European cities including Barcelona, Paris, Florence, Zurich, The Hague, Edinburgh, and Berlin. That first European tour in 1952 opened in Barcelona, Spain during Easter week festivities. The performances were presented as a special holiday celebration with many political dignitaries attending. Brooks recalls the warm reception upon arrival in Barcelona and the closing night performance when the audience roared to standing ovation while 100 white doves were released during curtain calls. The first tour 
was in Barcelona. When we arrived in Barcelona from New York, at the airport we were met and all the girls in the country received a big bouquet of flowers. And then the last night of the performance, we were all given, the boys were given souvenir cufflinks or letter openers or one from Toledo. The jewelry from Toledo is a special kind of jewelry. And then they opened the curtain and released hundreds of white doves into the audience. Applause, naturally. And performance started in Barcelona at 10 o'clock at night. And or 5 o'clock in the afternoon was matinee, 10 o'clock was performance at night. Aside from differences in performance times, Brooks found out firsthand the many challenges related to performing internationally while touring with New York City Ballet in Europe during the early 1950s. One of the biggest issues was stage and dance floor quality. I remember most of the theaters in Europe in those days still had a rake, which was the stage was slanted upwards to the back and down toward the orchestra. It was dangerous because the floor had gaps between planks of wood and holes sometimes. And I think they were thinking of taking a linoleum with us, but we didn't. The worst rake, I think, was in Barcelona at the Liceo, which was incredible. Almost could j jump into a hole in the, <laughs> in the stage. I don't know how the ballerinas manage on point, but that was one of the difficulties of touring. Stage quality while touring Europe with New York City Ballet in those early years wasn't the only issue to be taken into consideration. There were also details like salary and finding suitable housing while on tour, which had to be addressed. When we went to Europe, we had to agree to take a cut in salary from $85 to $55 a week or something like that. And they had to find our own lodging. They helped. They suggested where we stay and the prices and all. Suitable housing was often a difficult issue to solve while on tour in 1950s Europe. Many of the New York City ballet dancers commonly pooled their funds together to share the cost of renting furnished apartments rather than staying at hotels. Brooks recalls one such housing situation where he, Jacques Dembois, and Sean O'Brien all lived together. We didn't like where we were staying, on top of a cafe or restaurant, and everything smelled of fried food, fried oil and everything. And then the plumbing didn't work and so so Jacques Dumbois went around and he found an apartment in a private home or pri uh, apartment near the bull ring and uh, it was included a meal or two and they had a maid that did the laundry and what have you and the first meal we had was for lunch and the first course was mashed potatoes <laughs> and then we had fresh fried shrimp or sardines, or uh, it improved a bit. Well, Sean O'Brien was always my roommate from doing Broadway shows. We roomed together because he was always fun and having good time. Jacques was always on his own or whatever, but in that occasion, Jacques had his room and uh, Sean and I, I don't know, we all had our own bed, let's say. and. Uh, the rest of Europe was like that. While touring Europe, the New York City ballet dancers spent lots of time traveling between cities, mostly by train. One of Brooks's fondest memories of touring with New York City Ballet was during the 1953 European tour, when he spent time in George Balanchine's train compartment with Tennessee Leclerc and her mother Edith. We were going from Trieste to go to Germany, but we had, have somehow we stopped in Innsbruck, Austria, before going into Germany. And uh, we had different compartments in the train. In Balanchine's compartment, there was Tandy Kill and her mother, Edith, and Balanchine. And I went into the compartment also, and they were playing games. And playing a game, which game? It was just uh, what kind of animal does so and so remind you of? And someone asked, What animal would you say Brooks is? And Balanchine said, He reminds me of a giraffe which I thought was rather wonderful and kind of funny at the same time. 
Like all ballet companies, things can get somewhat tedious while trying to rehearse and perform overseas on tour, and New York City Ballet was no exception. Brooks recalls a particular instance while touring Europe in 1955 during a rehearsal that involved a brief exchange in front of the whole company between George Balanchine and his then wife, Maria Tallchief. I remember 1955 in Marseille on our tour of Europe. We were rehearsing Balanchine's new version of Swan Lake, and we were rehearsing, and on the court of ballet, we were all sitting on the floor at the back of the stage, and there was Maria Tallchief and Andre Gleski rehearsing. And Maria liked the old version of the Pas de Deux, and uh, Balanchine was insisting, and Maria, being the type that she was, and strong-headed, said, Oh, George, you don't know what's beautiful. And, of course, we all sort of huddled in a group waiting for the backlash, but there was none. I presume there was no backlash because they were married. They probably had a backlash to the, between the two of them in private. So. Maria Tallchief was the original firebird in Balanchine's re-choreographing and staging of the classic folktale to Igor Stravinsky's score. Brooks was in that original cast at New York City Ballet and recalls the differences between the production back then and how it is presented now during present day. When I was in the New York City Ballet and we did the first performance of Firebird, it was all the costumes of Chagall, the original costumes, except the Firebird and the Prince were redone by Skarinska and Balanchine. And maybe Maria had something to do with it because she was the lead. Anyway, Chagall, it has been said that he wanted nothing to do with the performance because they were not his designs. What were the costumes like when you wore them? Well, the monsters, for example, were in tights with exaggerated heads and arms and everything. You made your entrance crawling on the floor. That's another thing. In that scene with the monster scene, there was a backdrop like a forest, upside down and like a reflection, and that un kept going up slowly, and that doesn't exist anymore. But that was a magical moment. At the end, the last act, the wedding procession, we were dressed in peasant big pants and boots and hats, but they looked like rags. They were not uh, like the ones they used now. It was went with the decor, because it was done by Chagall. So what was it like to watch Maria Talci from the perspective of laying on the stage? That must have been... Well, nice. you, I thought, well, like everybody thought, that was divine because the whole production at that point was being redone by Balanchine. So you thought, well, it's something great, you know. But when I saw it recently, I didn't know what all the fuss was about because there's not much dancing really. Did a lot of bourreing around the stage and, and doing a few turns and pirouettes, but I, I didn't think it was very technically extraordinary. You see, I never really had seen it from the front, from the audience. And I don't know how I would have felt if I'd seen it then from the audience. <laughs> and do you recall anything from the rehearsal process? No. no? Not watching Maria no. Tulsa? I realized then that me on the floor behaving, I was a grown man, behaving like a monster, crawling on the floor like an idiot, that it's about time I got off stage. That's what, because I was uh, not happy dancing anymore. Firebird was the uh, straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. She burned me. <laughs> <laughs> After leaving this stage and New York City Ballet behind, Brooks's professional life took yet another creative turn, as he explains about how he got his start as an art collector and gallery owner in New York City. When I left uh, the New York City Ballet in 1955, 
I was proposed to work with Alexander Yolas, who had been a dancer before, and after that he opened a gallery called the Hugo Gallery, which became very famous in its day and even known today. But he suggested I come and work with him after leaving the New York City Ballet. I did, and he went off to Europe and opened galleries in Europe, and I kept the gallery going in New York and cooperated with him with artists uh, that he showed in Europe and started in New York, like René Magritte, Victor Browner, Mata, uh, and some younger people, Nicky de saint fal Jean Tingeli, Marcel Rice, and American young people, uh, Bill Copley, uh, who signed his paintings as CPLY, and Harold Stevenson, and then uh, Ed McGowan, and uh, Franco Charlo, and uh, some other young people. And that lasted until 1986. And the rest is history. <laughs> this concludes our audio retrospective on the life and career of Brooks Jackson. We hope you enjoyed listening to his stories and experiences and wish to thank everyone involved for their help in making this project a reality.